Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Island College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds in leaky black. The Island College Basketball Podcast it is presented by Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's, a sub above. David Cobb is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent it's after 1 a.m. on the East Coast. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, Please go ahead and do that while you're here. All right, let's get into it. Friday night was a historic night in the NCAA tournament because for just the second time in history, a number 16 seed upset a number one seed. Final score, number 16 seed fairly Dickinson, 63. Number one seed Purdue, 58. FDU was a 23-point underdog, won the game by five. David Cobb, is it clear to you? Because I think it's clear to me, and we'll talk through it. Is this the biggest upset in NCAA tournament history? Yes, and here's why. Although UMBC over Virginia will rightly go down in history, remain the first time a 16 ever beat a one, that's never going to change. That'll always be the first time that a 16 beat a one. The disparity in terms of point spread, and then also just the David versus Goliath element of this one in particular. Fairly Dickinson, smallest team in the country. Purdue, seven foot four, Zach Eady just added another layer of improbability to what Fairley Dickinson uh, accomplished tonight. So I say, yes, maybe it's recency bias. Ask us again in three to four years. Maybe it's a, it's a different answer, but uh, here just a few hours removed. Oh, Fairley Dickinson over Purdue feels like the biggest upset in NCAA tournament history. Let's stop here for a second, and we'll get back to all of the numbers that back up that claim. But you mentioned Fairley Dickinson, smallest team in college basketball at the Division One level. Purdue headlined by Zach Eady, the seven foot four um, favorite to be just everybody's national player of the year. Um, this was wild when I saw you tweet it. Uh, you back in January. We're talking to Tobin Anderson, now a star of the sport, the fairly Dickinson coach. And I want you to talk me through it because somehow, some way, you ended up in a conversation about a hypothetical, like, hey, what if you get into the NCAA tournament and you end up playing because Purdue was ranked number one in the country at the time? You're a 16 seed. That's what you're going to be if you're in the NCAA tournament. You end up playing Purdue with seven foot four Zach Eady. And you guys actually had a conversation about this maybe it could happen game, and then obviously it did happen. Just sort of talk us through how all of that went down. Yeah, I mean, just the the fact that I even ended up in Hackensack at the Rothman Center in, in Tobin Anderson's <laughs> office on January 31st is kind of a, a random story. But we happened to be in New Jersey for a few weeks for my wife's job. And, you know, what do I do when I find out where we're going to a new place? I start getting on uh, Kim Palm, looking to see which D1s are having cool stories in the area where we're going to be. It's how I ended up writing about Southern Miss this year of all teams, you know. But we get sent to New Jersey, and I'm looking around, and I'm saying, wow. Fairly Dickinson was four and 22 last season. And here they are in first place in the NEC with a first year coach and one of the smallest lineups of the modern era. This is incredible. So I, I reached out to their SID who, Oh, by the way, is an undergraduate student. The sports information director for Fairly Dickinson basketball is an undergraduate student. He's incredible. His name is Jordan Sarnoff, but that illustrates, does it not, Gary, the disparity in resources between an NEC team and a Big Ten team. Jordan Sarnoff is an excellent SID, he, but he is an undergraduate student, and, and to me that is a, a, an amazing illustration of how not only in stature but also in resources this was a David versus Goliath matchup. But, yeah, I went up there, watched a practice, Got to sit in the office with Tobin Anderson for a while. We were just kind of talking uh, hypotheticals uh, at the end of our conversation. I was like, you guys could likely end up as a 16 seed. And at the time, Purdue was, was the number one overall seed uh, projection. And so what, what, what do you guys do if you get matched up with Purdue? And, uh, you know, he chuckled. And, and I actually ended up using the quote at the very end of the story, or at least part of it. And uh, it was it was just wild to see that come to fruition. And it's been fun sort of exchanging text messages over the last couple of weeks with somebody who has now become <laughs> the face of the NCAA tournament. Uh, it's 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 been wild. So uh, just an incredible ride for, for Tobin Anderson, who I, I think this is important to note. 
10 and a half months ago, he was hired. Yeah. He didn't get hired until early May. Right. Fairleigh Dickinson didn't decide that it was parting with Greg Horenda until several weeks after the season. So the fact that he was able to piece something together on the fly and turn a four win team into the team that pulls arguably the biggest upset in NCAA tournament history. It is one of the most wild and improbable stories in this sports history. So I've been in studio all night at the CBS broadcast center uh, for CBS sports network. You can probably tell from my suit and my shirt and green tie St. Patrick's day um, makeup still in full makeup. Didn't have time to take it off. Rushed here. Got here as quickly as I could. You look we good. had, we had, uh, do I look smooth? Am I, am I, am I, am I not shining under the lights? That's the main goal with this bald head. You got to get enough powder on it to make sure you don't shine under the lights. <laughs> we had Tobin Anderson on CBS sports network tonight. And I used that opportunity to ask him about your conversation with him back in January. Not as got the clip. Let's roll that now. Tobin, Gary Parrish here. I, I gather you had a conversation back in January with my colleague David Cobb about the possibility of maybe when Purdue was ranked number one in the country, playing Purdue in a one versus 16 matchup. And you guys actually, you know, talked through it. How surreal is it to be sitting here in March after actually living through that game and then finishing on this side of it? Yeah, David and I were laughing about it. We were sitting in the office and what, what would happen if you played against Zach? And yeah, I said, we'll, we'll have to triple team him, quadruple team him, send the whole team at him, whatever. We were laughing and joking. All of a sudden, it came true. I'm like, oh, my God, we, we got to go do this now. So uh, amazing. Like, just to, to walk out there and see them and see how good they are. And I've got tremendous respect for Purdue and how they do things. So, um, you know, we, we understood the challenge at hand. It was an unbelievable challenge. But it was, uh, you know, our guys just played terrific. I mean, I just I couldn't believe how well we played. And, um, you know, it, it, this, uh, that's what makes March Madness so special in the college in the NCAA tournament so special as a chance for a team like us. If we played them 100 times, they'd probably beat us 98, 98, 98 times. But a one time, a one chance, a puncher's chance, um, we got it done tonight, and that makes it special. You know, uh, later in that interview, um, you know, I, 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 you know, we talked about a number of things, but one of the points I subsequently made is that this is, to me, the neatest thing about the NCAA tournament and really college basketball in general. Like, if we were in the first round of the NFL playoffs right now and we were NFL podcasters or whatever, we would be talking about things that in some form we've been talking about all year long. It'd be Joe Burrow. It'd be Lamar Jackson. It'd be uh, Patrick Mahomes, whatever. Uh, if we were in the Major League Baseball playoffs right now and we were podcasting about baseball we would be talking about some things that we've talked about already i write about this sport talk about this sport podcast radio interviews television i don't know that i've said 20 words about fairly dickinson all season long and yet now fairly dickinson is the biggest story in this sports postseason at least right now and i genuinely don't think that's anything you could get in any other mainstream sport in America back to the idea that this was the greatest upset in NCAA tournament history from a point spread perspective, Purdue was a 23 point favorite over fairly Dickinson in this game. Virginia was only a 20 and a half point favorite over UMBC. So technically speaking, this is a bigger upset than that one versus 16. The only other uh, one versus 16 um, that where we've, we've seen the 16 win in the history of the sport. Uh, some other notable things about Fairleigh Dickinson, uh, they come from a one-bid league where the conference tournament champion is going to get the automatic bid, because I'm not here, because Merrimack <laughs> isn't eligible for the NCAA tournament. Fairleigh Dickinson didn't win its – I mean, I guess technically they won their way to the championship game, and that was good enough given the opponent. But they did not win their conference tournament to get here the way every other school in a one-bid league has to do it. Um, Fairleigh Dickinson, Jay Billis pointed this out on Twitter, ranks 350 – heading into the game, ranked 353rd in the nation in adjusted defensive efficiency. And – 352nd in two-point field goal percentage defense heading into a game against Zach Eady. And Purdue scored 58 points. What? UMBC, by the way, in 2018, entered the game against Virginia, 188th at Ken Palm. Fairleigh Dickinson entered this game, 
299th at Kempom. And I want to give credit where credit's due. At Joe Stenardi <laughs> on Twitter, tweeted this out earlier, and it got retweeted into my timeline. I thought it was interesting. Uh, he tweeted that if you put 2023 Fairley Dickinson on a neutral court against 2018 UMBC, according to Ken Palm, UMBC would be a seven-point favorite over Fairley Dickinson. And so analytics, I, schmanalytics. You cannot measure. <laughs> you cannot measure the heart, Gary. You cannot measure the heart of the FDU Knights. You know what is a shame, though, Gary. Mm -hmm. St. Peter's was the Peacocks, and right. the Peacocks had a had a great noise associated with them. How do you how do you be a knight? I, be I, a knight I don't. Gary? I mean, I don't. I don't know how to be a knight. I need armor. I guess I would need ar It starts with armor. I think becoming a knight starts with armor. So. Uh, you just can't. I mean, I I I, I bet you can at one a.m. in New York City find armor somewhere. Pull I bet up Instacart. You can. I yeah, there's bet, a yeah. Hey, pull but up I another browser. But Instacart, I don't, some armor. I don't know where to get armor this time of night. In, even if in New Fairly York City. Dickinson, Gary, if Fairly Dickinson wins against Florida Atlantic and advances to the Sweet Sixteen, will you do a podcast hit with at least one <laughs> piece of <laughs> night armor? If I can find full night armor, I will wear full night armor on the podcast. If FDU finds itself in in the Sweet Sixteen, I, I gotta. I, there's gotta be a night costume somewhere on Amazon. I can I can get shipped to me by the time uh, we we. Uh, it's, you know, it's a uh, late Friday, early Saturday. I could probably get it by Sunday. You would think I might be ready to go in on uh, full armor on 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 Sunday night. Um. It just did incredible. It, and I made this point uh, on our show earlier at CBS Sports Network. Sometimes these these types of upsets happened. You know, it's Furman over Virginia or Princeton over Arizona. And people with jobs, congratulations, people with jobs like our jobs will sit there and go, well, you know, the thing people didn't realize heading into this is blah, blah, blah. And that's why you could have seen this coming. You know, nobody somebody, saw this. Nobody saw this. There's no way to see this coming. It's impossible to see coming. There is nothing in the data, nothing in nothing that says, oh, yeah, fairly Dickinson is about to upset Purdue. Everything suggested Purdue would just like you won't even I mean, I, I, full transparency. My call time tonight was late and I was like doing other things, getting ready to go to the studio while fairly Dickinson and Purdue was happening. And then it was like, OK, hold on. I need to now it's. This is real. It's time to pay attention to this and lock in. And after I locked in, I thought Steve Lapis was great on the call, by the way, because he made some some really interesting points that that I fundamentally believe were true as well. You know, those freshman guards, they were part of the reason Purdue was such a neat story. You get two guys ranked outside of the top 90 in their high school classes, and now they're starting together in a backcourt with the national player of the year for the number one ranked team in the country. Like that was the Purdue story for much of this season. And as the season progressed, those two guards, Braden Smith and Fletcher lawyer, they went from being among the reasons Purdue was ranked number one in the country to among the reasons Purdue was vulnerable down the stretch. And in this game, they combined to go, I believe it was six of 20 from the field and they combined for 10 turnovers. And the point Lap made down the stretch, and I noticed this as well, three minutes to go, two minutes to go, where like the clock is ticking, you're behind. It's time. Somebody's got to make a shot, and you can't even get the ball to Zach Eady. Nobody wanted to shoot. It looked, I don't, I, I'm hesitant to use the word scared to shoot. I don't even, but like nobody wanted that to, to it was like, can we get it to Zach? If not, what do we do? It, yeah, maybe. May was passed up a couple of really wide open shots. I That's think right. people, I think people not named Zach Eady were twelve of forty two from the field. So Zach Eady has a big night per usual. But all along for Purdue, minus those games in the middle of the season when Fletcher Lawyer was really going off, they've been without a primary secondary option behind Zach Eady, and that was so evident today. 
and it goes back to the old adage, which has proven only partially true, by the way, during this NCAA tournament, when you look at some of the, the crucial mistakes made by guards like Kihei Clark and Kendrick Davis uh, over these past couple of days. But, yes, to your point, Fletcher Lawyer, Smith for, for Purdue, freshman, and then you got uh, two fifth-year senior graduate transfers. D2 transfers, mind you, but experienced guys who have been in NCAA tournament action on a different stage, but still uh, with Fairleigh Dickinson, Dimitri Roberts, and Grant Singleton. Uh, and I think that was a huge part of, of how this outcome came to be. And I also love the fact that in y'all's hit with Tobin Anderson, he acknowledges, hey, we play this game 100 times. Yeah. We probably only win once or twice. He knows. He knows yeah. that. Uh, and, and that's what makes this – so incredible yeah like m me and my buddy brent stover always joke in studio because i've got these little go-to lines and and we laugh about them because we they're the they're the things you you're saying something very obvious but you try it but it like come it sounds uh uh enlightening but it's very very obvious so you say things like you know this is not a seven game series well of course it's not a seven game series but like the point you're trying to make is you don't have to beat this team four times in seven games you got to beat them one time that's all it takes and tobin i thought i appreciated that as well he didn't come in here and say hey listen we think we can play with anybody or we we feel like you know we're underrated under none of that he was like listen that's purdue they're awesome and if we played them 100 times, they'd probably beat us 99 times. But in this one time when we actually got to play them, um, we were better. And they were better, by the way. He made that point, too, which I also appreciated. He was like, we didn't sneak up on them and, like, steal it in the end. They, like, they played better. They all played them for really the entire game. Again, Purdue only scored 58 points. And as happy as I was for Tobin and for FDU and all of those fans – I really did feel sick for Matt Painter and for Zach Eady and for Purdue because um, I, I, you, you heard me talk about it on a previous podcast. Like I put Purdue in my final four, not necessarily because I thought Purdue was playing the best of anybody in that region heading into this thing, but because, you know, I, I wanted Purdue to go to the final four. I wanted Matt Painter to be a final four coach. I wanted those fans to get to experience that. It's a great fan base. It's a great program. It's a great coach. And you heard Matt Painter say, to, I thought this was interesting too. He said, you know, we've got good guys. You know, we, uh, other programs, they got some stuff going on, but we don't have any of that stuff. It seemed like he was referencing Alabama and that entire circus. Um, and and he was like, you know, we, we got good guys, but, you know, but this, and, and this hurts. You know, this, this is, we got to, we got to sit on it and deal with it and learn from it. But it's starting to stack up on them now. Because if you look at Purdue's last three NCAA tournaments, here's who eliminated them. Number 13 seed North Texas, number 15 seed St. Peter's, number 16 seed Fairleigh Dickinson. Like that starts to become connected to your program, connected to you as a coach. Until you fix it, this is the type of thing now people will start focusing on heading into the 2024 NCAA tournament if Purdue let's just say as a four seed somebody's going to say well I know I'm picking against them in the first round because you know I watched them lose to North Texas watched them lose to St. Peter's lost them watched them lose to Fairleigh Dickinson uh, they don't show up in this tournament I don't know that that's fair in fact I think on some level it's probably unfair I just know that it is something that'll happen and you could see Matt in his post-game press conference sort of I think coming to terms with that, like you can't undo this. I mean, you can never undo it, but you can't like start to change the narrative about you until next March. And that's a long time to wait to start trying to change the narrative about you now. Yeah. Well, it's like Virginia minus the national title, right? Um, not even a final four on Purdue's resume under Matt Painter. So they are starting to stack up, but I will point out, in the ashes of Virginia's historic loss to UMBC arose a national title winning team. Now I think Purdue has to make some upgrades to the talent level on its roster in order for that to be the case with the Boilermakers. But there is something to be said for the motivation to be had in a loss like this and that devastation sort of spurring you on to something greater. Again, I don't think that Purdue has the NBA level talent on its roster without a, a Jade and Ivy uh, to do that next season, but perhaps there could be somebody in the portal or perhaps 
Uh, there's a big jump for a player on the current roster to make to become that guy. But that's a silver lining is that, hey, the only other time this happened, the team it happened to won the national title the next season. Well, if I'm Matt Painter, that, uh, Matt Painter, that's exactly what I'm preaching to my team. But the difference, and you touched on this, when Virginia came back in 2019, they had multiple NBA players. I mean, that's the, that's the thing some people forget about that Virginia team. Like you, you, people lump all these Virginia teams in together because they all play slow and they're not like overloaded with athletes and whatever. Um, but like that Virginia team that won the title had like legitimate NBA talent and they were elite on both sides of the ball. Top five in offensive offensive efficiency, top five in defensive efficiency. That team was awesome. I don't know that Purdue is going to next season going to have multiple future NBA players unless they really get to work in in the transfer portal. And maybe what we learn is that okay, that was cool. The year Purdue started those two freshman guards who were sub ninety in their high school class, but maybe they don't both need to be starting guards at this level if you are trying to to you know, go to a final four, win a national championship. I know that might sound like revisionist history, given that Purdue with that backcourt did earn a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. But I think when this happens to you, you lose to a double digit seed for the third consecutive year. Like everything's got to be on the table. Um, I, I, I think Matt Painter and Tony Bennett are terrific, terrific first men and also basketball coaches. And I don't care what people on Twitter like the little shot folks want to take now, that's fine. Take your shots. But like, you don't know what you're talking about. Matt Painter is awesome. Tony Bennett is awesome. But I do think they probably both need to look in the mirror a little bit and ask the question, okay, why does this keep happening to us? Because with Virginia, three of the past four NCAA tournament appearances have ended with you know, losses to double digit seeds. And now at Purdue, it's three straight. I, I think both those guys are smart enough to you, you in, in, in any walk of life, uh, you need to self analyze every once in a while. Uh, why does this same thing keep ha- or similar thing keep happening? And I suspect that both of them will. Let me ask you this because boy, I got some pushback on this one on Friday night. You know, Zach Eady. Through the regular season, I guess you could say even through the Big Ten tournament, it's so clearly the national player of the year. Like if if you have a ballot and you don't put him number one, you're just trying to be different for the sake of being different. But at CBS Sports, we do not vote for national player of the year until after the Elite Eight. And I don't know if this was the catalyst for that decision, but at least for me, one of the things that I – never liked about the 2010, 2011 season is that when it was over, Kimba Walker was clearly the star of that season star in the big East tournament. We still remember the crossover uh, against Pitt. Uh, He goes on and leads the Huskies to the national championship. When you look back at that season, Kimba Walker is the star of it, but he wasn't the national player of the year. Jimmer Fredette was. And so, again, I don't know if that is what made us adjust the way we do this. But at some point, we decided we're not going to name a national player of the year at the end of the regular season or at the end of the conference tournaments. We're going to wait until the Final Four because then all but four teams are done. And you, you, you don't miss out on the Kimball Walker stuff. And with that in mind, I just sort of like – it's not like I tweeted, I'm not voting for Zach Eady for CBS Sports National Player of the Year. As we sit here right now, I think I probably still will end up voting for Zach Eady the same way last season I still ended up voting for Oscar Shibwe, even though he lost in the first round uh, to St. Peter's. But I just sort of acknowledged, at least in my mind, that for our purposes, this does open up the National yep. Player of the Year race because whether it's Jalen Wilson at Kansas or – uh, Drew Timmy at Gonzaga or Trace Brent, Jackson Davis, Trace Jackson Davis at Indiana. And we'll get to the night he had um, Brandon Miller at Alabama, Marcus Sasser, Marcus Sasser at Houston, Jaime Jaquez at UCLA. If one of these guys goes on this crazy statistical run and carries a team to the final four, I can imagine myself at that point voting for somebody other than 
the guy whose team got rocked in the first round by a 16 seed. Where are you at on that? Uh, I'm with you. So you go back and look at TJD, just for example. Indiana beat Purdue twice in the regular season. Now tonight, Trace Jackson Davis does something pretty historic that I guess we'll get to, but in terms of his stat line, he's off to a great start in terms of putting a team on his back and taking them somewhere pretty far uh, this month. I think we emphasize as college basketball media, college basketball fans, just the college basketball culture is so geared towards NCAA tournament performance that, yes, absolutely, these next couple of weeks are going to fully dictate how that conversation goes. I think in all likelihood, I'm going to end up voting for somebody other than Zach Eady. Okay. However, I will leave the door open for, let's say, uh, San Diego State makes the Final Four out of the South. Uh, Tennessee makes it out of the East. I'm looking at my bracket down here. Um, Northwestern makes it out of the West, and uh, Pittsburgh makes it out of the Midwest. <laughs> those aren't those aren't teams with with these crazy star players, guys who we're even considering for All American status right now. So it's conceivable that these five or six stars whose names we just mentioned don't get far enough to really warrant that consideration. But if somebody from that category, Miller, Timmy, Sasser, Hakez, et cetera, a couple more that we named, one of those guys uh, carries their team to a national title, they're the national player of the year. That's right. I mean, it, it can't just be a guy who was a, a, a first team all conference, but not an all American who then carries his team to the final four. That guy's not under consideration, but it, it's, it's other consensus all americans mostly first team all americans again if i were betting i would bet right now that i end up voting for zach Eady for national player of the year all i was pointing out on twitter is that i think that race that race that felt closed now feels open to me based on the way that we do it and um you know it, it was i wasn't surprised by the pushback but like some of it's just rooted in in nonsensical stuff like we all agree all season long. Everybody agrees that w your team's success matters when it comes to National Player of the Year candidacy. In other words, if not, why isn't Antoine Davis the National Player of the Year every year? He scores more points than everybody else. Make that guy. And I, no, why, why is he not even a candidate for All-American teams? Because his team stinks, and we don't pay attention to it. When your team loses in the round of 64 to a 16 seed, that factors in to the conversation if we have have decided as an organization to include that as part of your body yeah. of work. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this, Gary, what, Gary, what happened think, on Friday night matters. Yeah. I think what it is, is you just invite a lot of scrutiny upon yourself because of the way you pronounce groin. I can't say that word. It's such a weird word. It's so an, what is, it, what is Brandon Miller's injury? It's, a, it's an adductor injury. It's an Come adductor on. injury which doubles as a soft tissue injury. All right, so Adam Zucker is tossing it to you in CBS Sports Network on, on the desk, uh, have, teeing you up to talk about the biggest storyline around uh, Alabama going into the second round. A, key, a key, uh, key player is dealing with what, Gary? An adductor injury. Brandon Miller has been diagnosed with an adductor injury. He did not go through live contact drills on Friday. He remains a game time decision. I expect him to play. You can play with an adductor injury, but obviously he's in some sort of discomfort or else we wouldn't even be talking about this. I literally just Googled what is another name for that type of injury and it popped up adductor injury. Yeah. So now I'm committed. I might be the I only guy in college basketball calling what Marcus Sasser has an adductor injury, but mm -hmm. it is technically right. And it is so much simpler to say. I will take that every day of the week over your horrific and offensive pronunciation of <laughs> groin as, as growing. It's hard. I mean, it's, that's just why I don't that know why I, it's a mental hurdle. Like I have to, if you want me to say it, I have to like wind up like a pitcher almost I have to go <laughs> coin Des Moines. Then I say it. I can't, okay. Okay. I hey, going. Once All I right, get so going, you, I can do it, but I can't just I can't just say that word right out the box. Okay, so your kids at school, and the teacher asks him to write a poem about um, his his mom and dad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, wh how do you say poem? How do you, how do you say that? That word? I call poems raps. I would just say write a rap about okay. me. But you said you said point that you you said poem. Can poem. I say poem? Poem is that? Am I saying it? Poem. My I mean, I just was worried that I, I was worried that somebody who says groin, growing would also say poem, poem. 
and and you are that person. So uh, it's just you know. Anyway, I just this is tough. I'm, language yeah. language is tougher than you think for me. You know, this is where growing up in North Mississippi, like you can shed some of that stuff, but but maybe but maybe not all of it. Either way, Brandon Miller, Marcus Sasser, they're both dealing with adductor ADD mm-hmm. adductor injuries. Hopefully, they'll be okay this weekend. Let's move on. Providence lost to Kentucky on Friday. Iona lost to UConn. Is that it for Ed Cooley at Providence and Rick Patino at Iona? We're going to get into that next. But first, a word from our adductor partners. Hey, Calvin, you play golf. You think you can win one of those green jackets at the Masters? Well, if it's for being the most loving neighbor of the year, yes. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. So, Rick Pitino's season at Iona is over. Ed Cooley's season at Providence is over. We won't spend too much time on this, but it is worth discussing because outside of Fairleigh Dickinson over Purdue, it is probably the most talked about stuff in college basketball right now. Is Rick Pitino headed for a new job? Is Ed Cooley more specifically headed for the Georgetown job? Let me ask you this way. Do you think either man returns to his current school next season? And if so, which one? Yeah, I would say the higher likelihood that Ed Cooley returns to Providence. Rick Pitino leaving Iona wouldn't surprise me, wouldn't surprise anyone. Ed Cooley leaving Providence would surprise me and surprise a lot of people around college basketball. Ed Cooley is a Providence native who, for all intents and purposes, seemed like a Providence lifer. And the prospect of him up and leaving a place where he's built a perennial NCAA tournament team to go to another job in the same league, potentially at Georgetown, would be a baffling move, uh, to be quite frank. There's so much building that has to be done at Georgetown. There's no building, really, that has to be done at Providence. Perhaps there's more resources to be had at at Georgetown, a better chance to win a national title. But, man, I would be surprised if at the end of the day what we're seeing now is anything more than an aggressive leverage play to – extract more resources, you know, from his current position. Um, and I say that as somebody with very little inside information, I'm not on a, I don't, I don't know Ed Cooley personally, and I'm not texting his agent, but that's just the way I see it. I do know Ed Cooley. I know much how much he cares about Providence. I did think his post game comments were interesting. I respect them for being um, as candid as he can be. He didn't say, I'm not going to talk about this stuff or, you know, coaches, all lots of coaches will say things that sound like they mean something, but they don't really mean anything. Like, uh, I don't want to, I don't know if it's most famously, but you know, when John Calipari was a candidate for the Kentucky job while at Memphis, it, local reporters met him at the private airport and were like, So you're, you know, this, that in Kentucky. And he was like, um, I'm where I want to be. I think it was the quote was something along the line I'm where I want to be. I'm where I want to be. So yeah, a, like- a young David Cobb, a young David Cobb wrote, read that Gary Parrish article the next morning in the commercial appeal, actually. <laughs> so so he's like, I, I know where I want to be. I, I'm where I'm, I'm where I want to be. And then it was like, yeah, well, I, I was where I wanted to be. But then I changed my mind and decided I wanted to be at Kentucky once they offered the job. Right. So Ed didn't try to pull any of that stuff, which I again, I respect. He, among other things, said this, quote, it's a lot of decisions I need to make, a lot of thinking I'm going to do. There's a lot of reflecting I need to do, and I'm definitely going to let you know what I'm going to do when it's all over. What that suggests is is that this is a man who knows he has real options on the table and at least on some level, some level doesn't know what he's going to do, or at the very least, he is struggling with that decision. Uh, I'm not going to get into predicting what he's going to do or what he's not going to do, but it's pretty clear to me he's thinking hard about what his next move is. And even if he concludes for whatever reason that the Georgetown opportunity this time around is too much to pass on. Uh, I, I trust he's going to have a hard time pulling that trigger. I mean, yeah, so- the, like leaving home and, you know, there's an old adage in coaching and I don't necessarily, uh, you know, subscribe to it completely, but like leave well enough alone like just, hey, your life's good and you're doing great things in your hometown. People adore you. Like, don't don't mess that up. Um, obviously, like not uh, Chris 
Mac is uh, on some level an example of that he was at Xavier and everything was great and and it was his alma mater and then like the Louisville job's too good to pass up on and there was a lot of money he got a lot of money but did is he is he happier did it, it certainly didn't go well does he regret it with the benefit of hindsight I don't know it was a lot of money a lot of guaranteed money but if I were Ed Cooley I'd be I actually, I if I were at Cooley, I would have a conversation with Chris Mack. What do you regret? Would you do it the same way over? Talk me through this because you had a similar decision. That's going to be a tough one. I, I, I'm not going to, and I'm not even going to tell you what I think's right or wrong because it ain't my life. It's not my career. Ed Cooley is the, and his family are the ones who need to make this decision. But that one's really, really, really complicated and tough. Hey, um, let me tee you up on something here. Mm-hmm. Because you are better connected within these circles th- than I am. Over the last 36 hours, I've been so immersed in what's happening on the court that I've almost tuned out some of the coaching carousel stuff. But I want to present you a hypothetical scenario. You tell me, is it feasible that Georgetown could strike out on both Micah Shrewsbury and Ed Cooley? If so, where do you think that leaves the Hoya search? Because from what I saw yesterday, it seems as though Penn State's at least trying to make the effort to, to keep Micah Shrewsbury. Around. Yeah, well, and they should. They're a Big Ten school with tons of money. Like, you should pay everything you got to pay to keep Micah. And honestly, like, Providence doesn't have Penn State money. But if I were Providence, I would be telling Ed Cooley, whatever we need to do to keep you, that's what we're willing to do. Um, we, we're not going to make you take less money than you would. Like, we'll figure it out. Like, if you just decide, and I know ADs have had these conversations with coaches before, you, you, presidents even, you say, listen, if you just can't pass on that job, then then tell us that. But I can tell you we will commit to you in every way where you're not leaving money on the table, you're not leaving uh, travel budgets on the table, whatever. If you if you leave us, it'll just be because you want you decided you wanted to coach there more than here for whatever reason, but it's not going to be a money thing. You're not going to leave over money. If I were Providence, I'd be telling that to Ed Cooley. And if I were Penn state, I'd be telling that to Michael Shrewsbury. And I suspect on some level, those things are going on. I, I do think there is a scenario where they both just say, I, and we're going to stay where we're at. We're happy where we're at. We're going to stay where we're at. And then Georgetown's like, cause there were, you know, John Fanta reported within the past week, I believe Georgetown knows who it's hiring. Well, Things can fall apart. I mean, Dana Altman called the Hogs at Arkansas. <laughs> called the Hogs. Google, go, find that on YouTube. Most awkward. Ho- I guess all hog callings are kind of awkward in general. You know, just like without context, it's kind of wild to see. It's cultish is what it is. Like twenty thousand white people calling the Hogs. It's kind of weird, right? Freaked but, me out the first time I saw it. It's a weird thing, but um, and and so. But it is, but it's their thing. So whatever, I'm not judging. I just, it's like if you just flew in from another planet and first thing you saw was a bunch of Arkansas fans calling the Hawks, you'd be like, "What is happening here?" You just turn around and go home. You just turn around and go back to your other. You call, you call tonight. You'd be like, "All right." You ever like walked into a bar and you look around and you're like, "All right, this one ain't, this ain't for me." Mm-hmm. I think that's what you would do. You came from another planet. You you meet. You just happen to. You land in Bud Walton, and it's like 20,000 people calling the halls. You'd be like, you know what? This ain't for, Maybe Earth ain't for me. Maybe Earth isn't for me. Anyway, Dana Altman accepted the Arkansas job, went to Fayetteville, called the Hogs, and then said, this ain't for me. He basically is like the aliens, and he went back to Creighton. So these things can fall apart even after they're done. So even if Georgetown thinks it knows who it's hiring, that could fall apart. So to answer your question, after all that nonsense – uh, where where would Georgetown turn then? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you where Georgetown should turn. And it's the same place St. John should be turning, Texas Tech should be turning. Anybody with an opening, it should be Rick Patino. Like Dan Walken wrote a column, USA Today, earlier on Friday. Uh, it, I, I'm not suggesting he was stealing my points. He wasn't. He's the awesome columnist. But like it, it echoed a point that I have made over and over again, which is it's crazy to me that – people spend so much time asking questions like, well, can you hire Rick Pitino? Instead of just saying, why wouldn't you hire Rick Pitino? Like what, what, like what is, I don't, 
don't try to sell me on why you might hire Rick Pitino. Try to make me understand why you're not 100% going to hire Rick Pitino. He's incredible. Okay. He's incredible. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why you shouldn't. Um, there was this idea, and I think it was you and Matt who discussed this on the pod several months ago. At the least in November, December, there was this idea, this sense within the coaching world that Rick Pitino has sort of evolved into a little bit more of a figurehead type at Iona. Very involved in game coaching, some of the face of the program types of duties, but more passively involved in some of the things that are required of successful Power 5 head coaches, such as intense recruiting and things of that nature, game planning, film watching, scouting, etc., has that changed? Has the perception there changed? Um, or is it just a matter of like, hey, the dude wins and who cares if he's putting in 40 hours a week or 90? You know what I mean? Sorry to bring the, like, the hardball questions at 2.15 a.m., but like, I am genuinely curious about this. I don't need to know anything other than Rick Patino had Iona up at the half on UConn. Rick Patino had Iona in two NCAA tournaments, one two conference tournaments, really rolled through that league year after year after year. He is arguably the greatest college basketball coach of all time. Arguably. He's 70. The, He's 70. Yeah, but like, I, I know this sounds stupid, but you'll get the, I hope you'll get the point. He's a young 70. Like he's still like, how about this? Sometimes you see people who are 70 or 75 or whatever the age is. And you go, yeah, that person doesn't seem like they used to seem. They don't sound the same. They're a little slower. They don't seem as sharp. We notice that whether it's with our grandparents or our parents or or basketball coaches or football coaches. My point is, I don't see that with Rick. When I look at Rick Patino, I just see Rick Patino. When you look at Rick Patino, do you see Rick? Do you see an aging Rick Patino, or do you just see Rick Patino? I see Rick Patino who could succeed in a certain environment. I don't think Lubbock, Texas, is one of those environments. I cannot see Rick Patino at this stage of his career going to the Big 12 and posting the type of, of winning percentage that he has throughout his career. Yeah, I no, think I, St. John's, yeah, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I I think he should be the next head coach St. John's, and uh, the only thing that would make me question that would be if Providence opened and he's not the St. John's coach yet, and now you're picking between Providence and St. John's, and that's a conversation that – you know, Rick would need to have with the people he trusts because then there would be theoretically two good opportunities there. But uh, to circle this back and then move on, I, I think Rick Patino is coaching somewhere other than Iona next season, probably St. John's. And I I don't know on Ed Cooley because I'm not sure Ed Cooley is 100% sure what he's doing right now. So there were 16 NCAA tournament games on Friday. We have in some form touched on three of them. <laughs> so there's 13 left. I'm going to run you through them, and then you take it wherever you want to take it. Pitt 59, Iowa State 41. The Panthers continued the trend of first four teams getting to the round of 32. Congrats to Jeff Capel. Creighton 72, NC State 63. Terquavion season is over. Michigan State 72, USC 62. Tom Izzo is advancing in his 25th straight NCAA tournament, not advancing for the 25th straight time, but he is in the NCAA tournament for the 25th straight time. St. Mary 63, VCU 51, no computer tricking in the round of 64. Miami 63, Drake 56, first university ever named after a hip-hop star, uh, has been eliminated from the NCAA tournament. Xavier 72, Kennesaw State 67, fun game, Musketeers rallied. Overcame a big deficit and advanced. Baylor 74. You see Santa Barbara 56. Hucks owners Bears down at the half, but outscored UC Santa Barbara 39 20 in the second half. Advanced Marquette 78. Vermont 61. Tyler Kolick left the game for a minute, but returned. Marquette cruised. Gonzaga 82. Grand Canyon 70. Drew Timmy got 21 and 6. 72. Arizona State 70. Wild game back and forth down the stretch. Horn Frogs were actually down 11 in the second half, rallied to win. Kansas State 77, Montana State 65. Keontae Johnson had 18. Indiana got past Kent State. We mentioned Trace Jackson Davis 24 points, 11 rebounds, five blocks, five assists. First player in NCAA tournament history to get at least 20, 10, 5, and 5 in an NCAA tournament game. Uh, Florida Atlantic 66, Memphis 65, controversial ending. Tigers gave, gave up a layup 
in the final seconds and lost Penny Hardaway through his water bottle. And apparently Kendrick Davis and Malcolm Dandridge almost like were yes. in a scuffle on the sideline. There's a lot there, admittedly. Just go wherever you want to go. Yeah, I know that we both on our respective alternative platforms will get more into that Memphis FAU game, but we got it. We got to touch on it. Uh, I don't know if you were able to see the end of it in studio. Uh, I was live on television as it was. I went back and watched it. Um, Kendrick Davis first had like a little Kihei Clark moment. Like he threw just threw the ball away for no yeah. reason. I don't know what that was. And then you tell me if I've got it right. Uh, there's a There's a loose ball. Memphis seems to get control of it and call a timeout. There's multiple players calling timeout. Uh, the refs don't give it to them. Instead, make it a jump ball. It's Florida Atlantic ball. And then they get the baseline out of bounds layup for the win. Is that right? Correct. I think you can accurately state that a timeout should have been granted to Memphis. It's one of those where I would be curious to see. You know how the NBA does the last two-minute report where the following morning they release uh, a judgment on whether or not the uh, impactful calls of the final couple minutes were accurate or not. This is a situation where I would love for the NCAA tournament to have a last two minute report because that was such a crucial call in the game. And ultimately it kind of comes down to referee judgment. Do you grant the timeout as uh, the FAU players are, are, reaching to grasp the basketball it's a bang bang decision and really i think it is a, a judgment call and you can i think rightly say that the judgment went against memphis in a way that uh it probably shouldn't have but i mean ultimately boy for memphis this felt like the year with your two senior leaders after the win against houston the aac tournament title game the path is open for you with fairly dickinson defeating purdue you have FAU on the ropes in the last couple of minutes. And then you mentioned the Kendrick Davis turnover, a little bit of a defensive breakdown there at the end as well. I just, I have a hard time seeing how this isn't like a, uh, sort of a borderline catastrophe for Memphis, given the sense that they're going to have a roster full of freshmen next season. And, and the path was open for them. Maybe I'm just being reactionary yeah. in the moment, but it just feels like a devastating loss. Well, I, yeah, I don't know if it's a catastrophe for Memphis because I think they'll be good again next season, but it is a wild missed opportunity because all you got to do is not give up a layup in the final seconds or Kendrick Davis not throw that ball away or a million other things. You win the game and then you're playing, with all due respect to FDU, you're playing a 16 seed to go to the Sweet 16. Penny Hardaway, he wakes up uh, tomorrow morning and he can look in the mirror and say, I got to be the 16 seed to go to the Sweet 16. And there's a scenario where you're playing Tennessee in the Sweet 16, which would obviously be a massive story, Memphis versus Tennessee. And if it's not Memphis versus Tennessee, well, then it's Memphis versus Duke. And um, and now all of that's just wiped out in a matter of some weird, perhaps controversial, I'm not even sure, like whatever, but some weird moments at, at the end of the game. So I think more than a catastrophe, it's just obviously disappointing. Uh, for Memphis fans and for that staff and and a, a, a pretty massive missed opportunity. Like how often, I, I think this is probably true, Penny Harder will never again be in a position where all he'll have to do is beat a 16 seed in the round of 32 to go to the Sweet 16. That'll never happen again. And that's where he could have been if he won this game. Now, hey, Florida Atlantic, Fairleigh Dickinson, one of them's going to the Sweet 16. And oh, by oh, the God. way, now let's go back to the other side of that bracket. Either Tennessee or Duke is going to play Florida Atlantic or Fairleigh Dickinson in the Sweet 16. And it guarantees nothing because FDU, like, let's, that's surprprising. Florida Atlantic's good. Florida Atlantic's uh, they've won 32 times. They were only a slight underdog to Memphis. So Florida Atlantic can play with Duke or Tennessee. But if you're Duke, Tennessee, you got to be looking up above you right now and saying, we win this game. We're going to play a nine or 16 in the, in the Sweet 16. Uh, things are things are setting up nicely for us. Yeah, and I think this also increases the likelihood that we get some owl sounds from from Gary Parish on the pod in the future. I mean, if if the night armor doesn't work out from FDU, maybe I mean an elite eight run from FAU could get us some some owl noises. Well, honestly, I, mean, was a, I don't know what what our numbers are like, but but I know if they aren't what they were last year, it's because we don't have any any peacock noises and, and and owl noises could could maybe be a stand in there. There was a moment earlier today where I thought I was going to be just. Hootie-hoo! Hootie-hoo! 
and explaining exactly what bone stands for. And then Xavier stormed back. Funny moment post game, Xavier and Kennesaw State, Evan Washburn. Um, I was talking to Sean Miller and he was like, how did you avoid the upset? And Sean's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how we avoided the upset because Kennesaw State was really in, in control of that game for, for much of the game. And then, God, it was so long ago. Is it, was it Jack Nungy with the block at the, the block, buzzer? Yeah. And one of those where it looked like it was going to be a layup for the lead. And then he, I don't want to say he came out of nowhere, like he came at, but he, it was, he, you know, he had to get there and he got there and it was a, a, a massive play. And then, um, you know, you just, you, you, you feel sick for Kennesaw state because what a terrific story that is. And, you know, they were, you know, a layup away from advancing in the NCAA tournament. And yeah, they were, so- that was a, that was a phenomenal game to start the day. And it was such that at the under 12 timeout, I mean, I had 300 words in the quiver, quiver ready to go for right. immediately after the buzzer. I mean, Kennesaw state was the better team in that matchup for an extended period of time to, to the extent that it just looked like they were going to run away with the thing. And then they go cold. There was a, a big time and one that Xavier got to cut it from 13 to 10. And you mentioned the, the kerfluffle between Malcolm Dandridge and Kendrick Davis from Memphis, but boy, there was a, a heated exchange between Sule boom and yes. Adam uncle on that Xavier sideline, man, I, I got to know what's going on there. It seemed like from reading the body language, the rest of the game, they sort of were able to get past that, but you're one, you got to wonder with Zach Fremantle out, that has not been the same team since then. And now you, you, you're seeing some, some uh, contention arise in, in the final moments of a, of a key game uh, against a 14 seed. I don't know. I just, is it something that feels a little bit off to me about, about where Xavier is right now going into the second round. Yeah. Um, you know, but like it, it might catch up to them, but like they, the, 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 when you're down to that degree, you uh to come back and win it like you just take like I thought Sean's post game comments sort of underline that like I don't know how we get we got ourselves in that situation I don't know how we got out of that situation but that's over and we're now into the round of thirty two where Xavier now plays Pitt and that's interesting yeah, because yeah, that's where he's from yeah yeah he's Sean from Miller. there there was yeah. a time where like Sean Miller was like like the, you thought maybe he'll be the next Pitt coach and. I guess at the time Pitt hired Jeff Capel, like it just couldn't work. There was like, I, I don't remember the timing exactly, but it was like, if I remember correctly, Pitt didn't feel comfortable hiring Sean Miller under those circumstances. But anytime you get a guy against, uh, you know, uh, his hometown school, that, that, that can be, uh, a, a, there's storylines there. And so Sean Miller coaching against Pitt, that's going to be a major storyline on Sunday. Rather than look back at, at, at the rest of these games, because we ran through them and scores and the leading scores and all that, it does lead to some, some fun Sunday games. Miami against Indiana, Pitt against Xavier, um, St. Mary's against UConn. TCU Gonzaga is the one I might be looking most forward to because that's a 3-6 game, but TCU with Mike Miles Jr. is closer to a three seed than a six seed. Uh, the Zags are going to have their handful there. Yeah, they will. Gonzaga really impressed me. They were a sneaky uh, team today in the sense of like, if you're multi-screening, you weren't going to give Gonzaga Grand Canyon a whole lot of priority in terms of like your main screen after you see them rally uh, to go ahead at halftime after trailing in the first half. They, they for the final 26 minutes of the game, looked like peak Gonzaga. And that to me was a a really encouraging sign on a weekend where all these upsets have occurred. Uh, You see teams like Xavier struggling uh, down to the wire in the exact same seed matchup, a a three versus a 14. So Grand Canyon comes out, kind of punches them in the mouth. And then behind, I think it was 28 points from Julian Strauder, Gonzaga battles back and at one point leads by 22 in the second half. So I was impressed with Gonzaga. I think that TCU game will be very similar to the TCU Arizona game from the second round last year, because that Arizona program is modeled after the Gonzaga program in a lot of ways. And now we get TCU Gonzaga in the, uh, in the second round this year. So if this uh, game is anything like that TCU uh, Arizona game was a year ago, then boy, we, we are in for a good one there on Sunday. Yeah. And you know, we mentioned 
the Providence Kentucky game in the context of is it Ed Cooley's final game at Providence? But Kentucky, it is worth noting, wins an NCAA tournament game for the first time since 2019, and it sets up what should be a, a really fun game on Sunday. Kentucky, Kansas State, uh, Jerome Tang, it's well documented, picked to finish last in the Big 12, uh, instead uh, finishes in the top half of the league, was you know tied for first or in first for a good portion of the conference schedule. They get a three seed, and uh, you know. Kentucky, Kansas State is in that – the best window, television window you can have on Sunday is that late afternoon CBS window. And, you know, that that's the game CBS wanted there on Sunday. You wanted Kentucky to win. You wanted Kansas State to win. You want uh, those two programs, which is a rematch of a recent NCAA tournament – game they played against each other uh that that'll be the high profile game on on sunday afternoon and and kentucky and kansas state both looked both looked pretty good on friday night yeah i just wish Xavier wheeler could come back so we could have the undersized new york city guard Xavier wheeler and marquis (laughs) noel Noel. battling it out uh but i guess we'll have to to ride with a dimitri roberts uh from fairly dickinson who is also uh, from the city, man, it is just crazy. Like how many really good short guards come out of New York city, uh, Noel and, and Keontae Johnson taking on Kentucky. That will be must see TV. I'm also really excited about what our, what our little homie from Memphis cam Jones did yeah. uh, for Mark. Did he score today. like I was, I was doing a million things earlier. Did he score like 15, how many points in a row did he score? So yeah, during a stretch early in the second half, he scored 18 in a row. There were That's a couple of that's my little homie from Memphis. Yeah, uh, there, there were a couple of ridiculous heaters uh, in today's action. Another one, Adama Sanoga. I know we talked a little bit about the Iona side of things there, but uh, I want to say he scored like 13 straight for UConn in a stretch where they opened that second half uh, trailing against Iona. Then Sanoga goes on this unbelievable heater. By the time it's over, they're ahead by, I think, 11. Uh, that was wild. Then Ryan Kalkbrenner, I think he scored 20 in the second half uh, for Creighton against NC State. Uh, just just putting the work to to uh, the Wolfpack there in Denver. So the Big East in particular had some individual performances today that were just phenomenal. And uh, yeah, Cam Jones stepping up big for Marquette with uh, Tyler Cole. kind of had like a hand thing going on. I, yeah. I haven't seen much from Shaka like what that was or like how bad it might be. But I mean, he played through it. He wasn't himself though. So for them to get big time contributions uh, from another source there was was encouraging. And that's the other storyline that has developed with this NCAA tournament. And then we'll get out of here unless you got things to say. It's 2.30 in the morning here in New York City. Um, this is outrageous. This is outrageous behavior. Be talking at 2.30 in the morning. To be awake at 2.30 morning. To be awake and sober at 2.30 in the morning. Yeah, this is them, them behavior, Gary. This is, none of this makes sense to me. It's them if, behavior. If I, if, yes, this is definitely them behavior. I, you see me awake at 2.30 in the morning. It ain't It ain't because I've been... Yeah, I'm not sober. I promise you that. But here I am. I mean, I am right now. Still got makeup on. I got to take off for crying out loud. The injuries. Like, there are legitimate championship contenders dealing with injuries at Alabama, at Houston. And now, again, we'll see how Tyler feels uh, by Sunday. But it is true. He had to leave the round of 64 game. Um, your, your, you know, your Big East player of the year had to leave his round of 64 game. Was he the biggest player of the year? I don't want to. I, don't I know, know he was somebody's biggest player of the year. Hey, hey, let's just keep it simple. The Big East tournament MVP. Po- the starting point guard for the Big East champions and the Big East tournament champions had to leave the game with some sort of uh, discomfort. So there's just a lot of stuff. That's usually something reserved for the NBA playoffs where injuries like dictate who wins and loses all over the country. But. Um, it has now become an, a, an unavoidable storyline with this NCAA tournament. Like, how healthy are the best players on some of the best teams? Because uh, not everybody is banged up, but you got issues at UCLA, you got issues at Marquette, you got issues at Kentucky. Um, obviously, Tennessee lost its point guard late in the season. You got issues at at Alabama. You got multiple issues at Houston. There's a lot of teams that are banged up right now that are trying to win a national championship. And really these little nicks and bruises and other things could be the type of thing that prevents you from doing that. A scary deal. 
Yeah, another one to add to that, not because he's a significant player in terms of production, but because he plays for a team that has very little bench production. That's Mason Miller from Creighton, a uh, left today's go. game for the Blue Jays, didn't come back, which you're like, okay, he doesn't play a ton, he doesn't score a whole lot, but that's a team that doesn't go deep at all. And now you lose one of the few players who you do reliably use off your bench that could accumulate for the Blue Jays as this you know tournament goes on. And then, you know, Norchad Omie did play today for Miami, so I think that was an encouraging sign. But even TCU's Mike Miles, who led TC with 26. He, he was dealing with injury stuff, you know, throughout that game. So yeah, the, the nicks and bruises begin to add up as this thing goes along. I think it's time to call it a night. Shouts to Devin yeah. Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Shouts to all of you weirdos being up at 2 30 in the morning on the East coast. I hope all of you live on the West coast who are watching live. That's the only thing that would make this sensible to me. You ever catch me listening to a podcast at 2.30 in the morning? You'll never catch me listening to a podcast at 2.30 in the morning. So I appreciate all you guys being here. I hope you had a happy and safe St. Patrick's Day. And we're going to be back sometime after midnight on Saturday night. And we'll do this whole thing again. Hopefully we'll keep it shorter because this is stupid. Good night.